This is Georgia Focus, a public affairs presentation of this radio station and the Georgia News Network. For the next 30 minutes, we'll feature a discussion about an issue of importance and relevance to you and your neighbors across Georgia. Welcome to Georgia Focus. I'm John Clark on the Georgia News Network. The Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice is a multifaceted agency that serves the state's youthful offenders at facilities around the state. Their mission is to protect and serve the citizens of Georgia by holding young offenders accountable for their actions through the delivery of services and sanctions and by supporting youth in their communities to become productive and law-abiding citizens. Today, our guest is Avery Niles. He is Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. Commissioner Niles, it's good to see you. Well, thank you for the invitation. Who are the youth that are in your care? You have 20 six facilities around the state who are the the youth the youth that we have in our systems that's in our 26 facilities throughout the state are those that society has deemed that they need to be off the street and in a secure confinement whether that's for the participation of their sanction and or their rehabilitative stage so the court has sentenced them uh, and they send them to you and, and uh, are they up to a certain age? Twofold. One is, of course, our kids that's in the Georgia system are not necessarily what they consider found guilty. They adjudicated mm. okay. or a complaint has been filed on the youth. And though the age range from I have them as low as 11 years old all the way up to their 21st birthday. What are some of the uh, things that they're uh, they're in your care for? What are some of the infractions that they've committed? We have some in there from a simple battery, from a family violence type situation where that public safety is at hand. And then we have youth that's in our care for uh, taking the life of someone else. Out of those 26 facilities that you have, do some specialize in certain areas? Uh, are some uh, more maximum than, than others? Yes, sir. Uh, we have facilities in the state that's what in layman's term is our regional youth detention facilities. And then we have our lawn care facilities, which is our YDC youth detention facilities. And they're scattered throughout the state. And, and one of the things that we're in the process of doing is stratification, making sure that the kid that comes to us fit the location where they should be, get in the right support, the right rehabilitative services so that they won't reoffend when they exit our facilities. Do you try to keep them close to their hometown? I know that might be difficult if they have to go to a specific facility, but but you try as best you can? We do, and we have a classification process that every youth that come in our system goes through. And in some areas of our state, that's an easy task to put the kids close to their home. But then again, sometimes the home life of some of these kids, the individual's youth, need to be away from the family family and get the rehabilitative services. How many youth do you have currently in the system right now? We have roughly 13,000 that's in our care. Once they enter your facility, what happens? It has to be daunting for them. What is the process? What happens when they enter? Wow, that's that's a good question because I'm often asked, is my child going to be taken care of? When do he or she get out? And then how long would they be there? So what we do is, depending on the location in our RYDC, those are our short-term placement. And kids usually stay there within 72 hours to 30 days, depending on the judicial circuit and the information that's gathered and furnished to the court determines the length of stay that those kids that come in our RYDC regional. And then we have the long-term care, and that's after commitment, after adjudication, and they stay anywhere from 24 to 36 months. And the good thing about that is with the new juvenile justice reform, that's going to be narrowed down to making sure that those kids transition from our secure confinement into the community. Because a lot of times the community is where the healing takes place Mm -hmm. and not necessarily inside the facilities. I cannot imagine what some of the parents would go through when they find out that their kid will have to spend the night in our secure confinement to where those individuals are, in layman's term, locked down. For whatever reason that they're in there, we make sure that their well-being is, is taken care of. Obviously, they receive medical treatment, counseling, and things like that too, right? Yes, sir. All entry, once the kids get to our doors, we do check them physically to make sure that they're equipped with all the necessities that they 
in, entitled to? And that's part of the medical screening. A lot of people don't understand that we are the 181st school district. So yeah. so we want have a dual school system, dual accredited school system within our care. So we make sure that the placement of those kids that's in the classroom, especially those that's long-term care, I forget the average, but we have a average kids that come to us, their average is three grade point averages behind mm -hmm. when they arrive to us. We try our best when the kid relocate from us back into that traditional school that they are at grade point or exceeding grade point average. That's interesting that you are the 181st school district, so you're a school within within your facility. Then. Dual accredited, that is which, is, which is impressive, and a lot of people don't understand that. But when you look at the expense of what it takes mm -hmm. to house a youth, you got to add in all of the medical, you got to add in all of the counseling, as well as that full-time school. Are they allowed visitors? They mm -hmm. are. They're control visits mm -hmm. to where the parents of those loved ones or the care providers can come and visit those kids. And what we do is during our or orientation process, the kid uh, will, will be able to know who can visit or furnish a list of names that he would like for them to come and visit. Of course, uh, parents and families would be concerned about safety uh, inside your facilities. So how do you work to ensure their safety? We do it twofold. One is it's a safe and secure facility. Mm -hmm. And the second fold is that um, we make sure that the kids' well-being is taken care of by making sure that our staff is adequately supervising their youth 24-7. Today we are talking with Commissioner Avery Niles. He is the Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. And I know, Commissioner, you've, you've had a number of accomplishments as well. You recently created the Office of the Ombudsman. We've been here under Governor Deal's leadership since November of 12 and creating all kinds of opportunities for engagement of our youth. Or one of the programs that I'm all hyped over is the Ombudsman's Office. Uh, from where I came from, my career started in Hall County at Hall County Sheriff's Office, went from Hall County Sheriff's Office to become the prison warden. And dealing with kids, dealing with adults, there's got to be a voice for the kids as well as for the people that cares for those individuals. And, and I created this office, um, and this office is for those parents to have a, a single voice because a lot of times we as an agency rely just on our staff to update us on important mm -hmm. issues that's going on in the lives of these children. And what I wanted to do is create that, that mutual so that if a kid that's in our care wants to grieve about a staff member, I want them to feel free to do that. Or if a loved one on the outside wants to have or grieve over some type of issue that ha the loved one has told them, that there's a single point of contact within our agency that handles all of those complaints, as well as suggestions. And we have a person or a, a team approach that's challenged to do that. And I tell you, it's very, very important that we do as an agency have this agency-wide because it's an agency-wide problem solver so that when those problems comes up, there's a voice. You've also uh, created a, a statewide chaplain position. I, I would think faith probably plays a, a large role, certainly in these kids' lives. So talk about that role and, and the, the statewide chaplain, but also faith inside uh, each of your facilities. I am from a Christian background, and faith without work is dead. And when we look at um, our kids and our care, regardless of what uh, background of faith they choose or what background of religion they worship, we wanted to create that avenue of a chaplaincy program so that those individual parents as well as the youth can feel free to worship and feel free to, to get the necessities that their kid can still maintain that level of religion and or uh, spiritual growth. Animal programs, too, uh, that's been used widely, in, even in, in some county jails in Georgia, and where animals are, are used as a way to, to reach through and, and make a connection with inmates and so forth. So do you, you have something similar to this? Again, that you know, and we, we've done so much in a short period of time, but our animal rescue or 
animal therapy is so important. When you look at um, our partners up in the Gwinnett County area, back when I was at the sheriff's office, they started this uh, program in their sheriff's office. And when I came to DJJ and, and talked this over with staff and talked about the process of bringing those animals in and letting the kids, letting our youth participate in, and not only that, but this is getting the counseling that the kids receive as well as the animals that we are getting ready for adoption where those kids are are coaching and working with the dogs so that they can go back into the community and be adopted so that that those individual dogs won't be have to be laid to rest and we have had success in that process when i said that i was thinking of that program in gwinnett i've seen the success of that program and that's uh, i'm glad to see that's expanded in, into your system too because that is a, a great program and certainly has to have an impact on the kids and it does and, and the reaction that we've been getting from our partners within the community and it's so amazing how an animal can change the attitudes of youth Mm -hmm. and it can change the attitude of our work it can change the attitude of the dogs the aggressiveness is not there and are helping train these dogs so that they can be adopted and not necessarily slaughtered what about uh, vocational opportunities uh, in your facilities uh, giving these kids uh, a job do they and do they have specific duties they have to perform and are there ways they can advance and maybe learn some skills too while in well of course with governor deals leadership you know georgia is, is the number one state to yeah. do business with sure. and we want to create while we have these kids in our care providing them all the necessities to be successful whether that's partnering with our department of labor or our community partners to get these kids the skill set partnering with the technical colleges of Georgia where we bring those professors in to help with vocational classes to make sure that the kids are when they leave us either going to go into a college and or technical school to get those kids the tools that they can be successful in the community. Uh, you have some mentoring programs as well. Uh, do you have people, uh, role models and so forth, work with the kids and come in and, and mentor them in some ways? We do, but that's where I need your help. We have, through our chaplaincy program, working with our churches, working with our community, I'm convinced a lot of the kids that venture into trouble don't have a positive role model in their life. And if we can partner with people coming into our facility, men and women, because we have women and our girls in Mm -hmm. our facilities also. So when I look at mentoring, I look at both male and female and can come in and provide a couple hours of that time a week. And you and I both know an item mine is a devil's workstation. Mm -hmm. And if we can install positive men and women in these kids' life. We on the verge of, of doing the remarkable change. So you you do have a need for people to volunteer and come and be mentored. How can they do that? How can someone get involved? I tell you, one of the good things is in your shoes project. Mm-hmm. We have we have a program that's designed and and we're partnering with our DOC and parole using our current ex offenders, our the kids that re-enter into society, and and it's that positive message to where youth, our youth at risk partnering with them guys and girls getting those in and i tell you throughout the state we have facilities and those individuals that want to participate i'm sure we'll furnish them they can check our website uh, at djj.gov and and receive all that information and there's drop down boxes to to sign up for mentoring a lot of the kids that you have have they been influenced by gangs we do, and and you know the the main reason why people want to belong to a game because they have had situations in their life where they was a loner, and they want to branch and hook up to somebody, and that game is just present, and they create a avenue where these individual kids are taking part in it for whatever reason, and we have created pamphlets and literature to give out to parents, and we go throughout the community and giving out that so that the parents can know those signs. They can know what the kids are using slang language or when those kids start to withdraw from the parents. And, and those are type signs that parents should know. And when we talk and teach gang prevention, um, we teach those to both to the kids as well as 
to the parents to make sure that they can recognize that and engage their kid and challenge the kid about positive participation and not necessarily negative innervation with those particular games. And, and that probably makes uh, your mentoring and having positive role models that much more important to have them come in and see that you don't have to be in a gang. You can go the other way. Right. Because the thing about it is a lot of those kids have lost trust in their parents. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those kids that's at risk come from single parent homes where that male or female is not involved in their day-to-day abilities and they seek those gang members that's going to provide for them. Another area that I know is a big problem in the state of Georgia specifically in, in Atlanta is the commercial sexual exploitation of children and I, I know that your agency Department of Juvenile Justice works very closely with that and talk about some of your initiatives uh, with respect to that. Well of course we've partnered with our, with the local GBI office as well as the city of Atlanta and our FBI task force, the CSAC victims, and and those are teenage girls that have been trafficked and, and males trafficked by older adults and used for their advantage. And we have partnered with those particular state agencies and federal agencies to come back. You know, uh, studies have shown that Georgia had one of the highest rated areas and we, Department of Juvenile Justice, we, we want to be there because those victims, and they are victims, come to us because they they have no other place that society has provided them an, an avenue. And, and what they do is get caught up in the prostitution ring and all of a sudden find themselves inside of our facilities on those charges. And we work with those other state agencies to determine if they are victims. And, and, and we've had success in restoring those particular kids back into the community in which they arrived here from and getting them the treatment that they need to deal with those issues at hand. Today, our guest is Avery Niles. He's commissioner of the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice, and we're talking about some of their services. You also do a lot of Work in the community. I know, uh, you know, you, connection with the community is, is obviously uh, very important with the Department of Juvenile Justice. So uh, talk about the ways in which you work with the community. I'm through a lot of crime prevention initiatives <laughs> and things like that. And, uh, and of course, this is the lead of, of our governor. He has a, a, a servant's heart. And when he's challenged the state heads to get involved in the community, he really means it. For instance, we, we've had in my area of the state where I live in Gainesville, Hall County, there's a nursing home, and this would be a real quick story. There's a nursing home there, and I visited a, a loved one in the nursing home, and as, as all of us have traveled through those quarters in mm-hmm. nursing homes, and you just happen to look over in, in some of the rooms, and they have old pictures that, that's hanging up on the wall or on the bookshelf, and then you go keep traveling to your loved one room and you you see where some of those individuals and you talk and interact with staff and determine that that they hadn't had a visit that they hadn't had a card just to say hey thank you for who you are or thank you for what you've done and then when you walk down our halls at our facility some of our youth never receive visits from their loved ones some of our youth never receive a card and one of the challenge things that I can't brought that back and, and, and challenge our staff, our kids can be a note card writer. And they write note cards or, or thank you card or greeting cards to those individuals in the nursing home. And those individuals in the nursing home write our kids oh, in our facility. Yeah. And we delivered a couple of months ago over 100 note cards, greeting cards, birthday cards to the nursing home and 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 you will not believe the the sunshine that we brought into that facility all because of of our kids as well as those those individuals that's in the nursing home things like that we we also done a a restock the shelves i'm the chairman of our food pantry at our church there in, in gainesville and i know that how our shelves are depleted during the holiday season and I brought this back to our staff and said, surely there's something that our kids that's on probation or our staff could do to help restock the shelves within the community. And so we challenged that and we had over 4,200 can items that our staff and teachers in our school district and then over in um, South Georgia, one of our community food banks stepped up and um, those are type things that we've done. Uh, we're in the process of doing another 
thing that I think will, will help, and that's repack the backpack. Repack uh-huh. the backpack. Because everybody is so excited to, to go back to school, and, and there are so many charitable organizations that, that contribute backpacks. And, and so the kids are excited to go back to school. All right. So, But what I wanted to do is say, well, let's repack that. Because the first day of school is gone. The teachers have given assignments. The students have started to use the material that they received. And I wanted our staff, and we've challenged our internal staff with the, the RDL to find out if we can do this statewide. What we considering is repack the backpack. So we're doing those school drive. And that's going to be on a continual basis to where uh, we partner with, whether the school district those facilities are or our community service offices are, then those individuals take those backpacks to the school and give it to those kids and the school determine when that kid is in need of new glue, oh, a okay. new notepad, and it's just restocking those particular or repacking the backpack so that the school can be in position to give out those items. And that's what our governor, our leadership there with his servant's heart. Another program that you have right now is a, you have a recruiting program. You need good people. And uh, we've learned a lot about what you do at the Department of Juvenile Justice so far in the show. And I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, qualified people out there. And jobs drive the economy, and uh, a lot of people are, are looking for jobs right now. Talk about what your needs are as far as uh, having good people. And, of course, taking another lead from the governor. This state is the number one state in our union to do business with. And just happen that our facility, our state Department of Juvenile Justice, have done for the last couple of weeks or month a job fair blitz. We've traveled throughout the state at our veterans at different Army bases looking for those veterans that's coming out and want to still be that authority Mm -hmm. and still be that positive role model looking for those veterans to come within our facility and guide the misguided leave the one that needs to be led and we're we're doing that blitz with our veterans because i believe that our veterans have paid some of them have paid that ultimate sacrifice and that's their Mm -hmm. lives but those that guys and girls that survived and coming back into Georgia, we have a job. We have a location for you to go. Not only that, but we do the blitz of radio announcement and um, throughout this state seeking those employees. Uh, we have, as a state agency, over 4,200 employees. Out of that 4,200, I've probably got 670 plus vacancies today and 300 plus are in our security end of it and then 295 range from our teachers all the way down to our janitorial services every one of those positions are key to our Mm -hmm. success and of course we're an agency that's on the move we're an agency that's on the change. And then I believe that in order for an agency to grow, we must change. And and change can start today. And we need those individuals that's looking for employment to come and call on DJJ. What are some of the uh, the qualifications that you're looking for, backgrounds? You mentioned military, but uh, does someone have to have a law enforcement background, or can someone have any background? You train them, I'm sure. Right. We, we train them. And, and a lot of times, like in our security end of it, there are some requirements that the individual has to meet, of course, got to be 21 years of age and um, be willing to work shift work mm-hmm. and, and, and pass a, a background. And then those uh, other positions, like a, a, a nurse, for instance, of course, you have to have a nursing degree and some of our positions that require college degrees. But our website, you can go to that website, click on employment, and there's a whole list of openings because DJJ is in the business to help, that, and, it, and we need those individuals. I'm sure a lot of people in Georgia who are qualified, I, and you know, we want to certainly help you get connected and, and get some good people in there. Are there any specific areas of the state where you need people, or is it statewide generally? Well, it's statewide generally, and the demand for jobs is, is statewide. Vacancy statewide, and and the reason that I can't give you a ballpoint figure because when I think about it from my last date review, 
We had openings almost in every facility throughout right. the state. Some areas of our state is more challengeable because of transportation. Transportation has always been an issue uh, when it becomes employment. Where can they go? Uh, what's the website to find out more about the jobs that are available and g- general information on uh, what you do in the Department of Juvenile Justice? You could go to www.djj dot state dot ga dot us that'll get you there and you can go there and, and look up uh, job listings you can look up information about their facilities and what they do and, and just find out a lot about the department of juvenile justice commissioner niles thank you so much for coming in today this is uh it's been a pleasure having you on the show and it, it's been a, a interesting listening to to what you do I, I think probably a lot of our listeners didn't realize what the work of the department of juvenile justice does so thank you so much for coming in and talking with us today. well i appreciate the opportunity and and i'll end with this and and, and it's a a quote no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care and today our guest has been uh, avery niles he's commissioner of the georgia department of juvenile justice and we thank him for being our guest today and of course we always thank you for listening to us and i'll talk to you next week on georgia focus you've been listening to georgia focus a public affairs presentation of this station and the georgia news network The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of the staff, management, or ownership of this station or the Georgia News Network. If you have comments or questions about Georgia Focus, contact John Clark at the Georgia News Network at 1-800-776-4666.